Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this Pegasus Group and Keating Chambers webinar on getting greenfield housing developments through the planning system. My name is Charlie Banner. I'm a QC at Keating Chambers specialising in planning and associated matters. I'm delighted to be joined today by uh, four leading experts and friends from Pegasus's multidisciplinary practice, all of whom I've enjoyed working with on a number of occasions in relation to greenfield residential developments, most recently obtaining permission on appeal for a car development in Ickford, Aylesbury Vale District in the face of Heristridge landscape and planning policy objections, some of the issues we're going to discuss today. Um, let me ask the speakers to introduce themselves in the order in which they'll speak, starting with Gail. Good afternoon, my name is Gail Stoughton. I'm Heritage Director at Pegasus. Um, I'm a mixed workload dealing with listed buildings, uh, other buildings, archaeology, uh, and I do quite a lot of appeal work. Andy. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Andy Cook. I'm based in the Sarasester office of Pegasus. Um, whilst I'm based in Sarasester, my work uh, is nationwide and I spend the majority of my time giving evidence at uh, uh, inquiries as a landscape expert witness. Thanks, Thank Andy. You. Neil. Hi, Neil Tiley. Uh, I'm a director at Pegasus Group. Um, I specialise in housing need and supply, similarly based in the Sarasester office, along with the, the other three you see before you today. And finally, David. I'm David Hutchison. I'm also one of the planning directors and I specialise mainly in development control matters and also site promotion and spend quite a lot of my time at public inquiries, um, normally as the planning policy witness. Brilliant. Thanks, David. Um, well, our focus today is principally going to be on applications and appeals rather than plan making. Uh, but please do feel free to ask any questions about the plan making context too. Um, questions, as I'm sure you'll be familiar by now from the various webinars you've been watching during the COVID period, uh, Q&A at the bottom of the uh, panel on Zoom. Uh, please feel free to ask any at any stage. Uh, I'll try and chuck a few questions at the speakers as they go along um, and uh, we'll have a <coughs> Q&A or discussion session at the end too after everyone's spoken. Uh, we won't be using slides, um, but we'll circulate a list of the main decisions and court cases uh, we refer to, hopefully, uh, today or, or tomorrow, uh, with hyperlinks as well for convenience. So that's all by way of introduction. So I'll hand over now to Dale, Gail to discuss heritage-rated issues. And Gail, you're going to kick off with um, the Supreme Court's judgment in Dill and tell us a about what this case is about and what its likely impact uh, is to be in practice. Yes, well... It's an interesting decision and just to mention briefly that it's, it has not and will not be a bonfire of list entries as, as perhaps it was first thought and that only very few things that are included on the list at the moment are likely not to be considered as buildings so no longer be considered as listed. Um, in any case, you know, I'd love to say that my caseload was largely 18th century urns which is what this case revolved around but it isn't and in any case if you're dealing with the kind of thing that isn't likely to be considered as a list of buildings so you know these garden furniture of this nature you're very likely to be either in a design, designed landscape or to be in the setting of something which is unequivocally still a building as defined on the list. So the, the key test that um, everyone was pointed in the direction of in the judgment is the Skerritt's test and that looks um, at size, permanence, and degree of physical attachment when considering if something is actually a building, so can be considered to be a listed building. So in terms of what this means, most of the run of the mill structures that you're going to be close to in terms of greenfield residential development, milestones, signposts, they're definitely still going to be considered as listed buildings being you know, physically attached. So it's not really going to have a massive impact, really interesting decision that got to the nuts and bolts of, you know, the very basics of a listed building, but no, not really going to affect greenfield development too much. And um, Gail, moving to um, the particular types of listed buildings commonly affected by greenfield developments, um, what are the common issues relating to listed farm buildings? Well, if you haven't had an application turned down on the basis of being in the setting of a grade two listed farmhouse, you know, you, you're really pretty much blessed or haven't lived. Yeah. I mean, it's, they are certainly potentially problematic. And that's because obviously most green fields are associated with farms and there are a huge number of listed farm buildings. 
There are over 13,000 entries on the list that include farms. Obviously, most of them aren't going to, well, not most of them, most of them are going to be farm associated, a few aren't. So a combination of association and sheer number means that it's quite likely to be a problem. In terms of this association, you can demonstrate that a lot of areas of land were associated historically through the tithe maps, which are largely available online. And they, these show that the areas of um, Greenfield and show the complexes that they related to, so they can make the connection between the listed buildings and potential sites. However, there are um, also uh, a lot of issues in terms of um, all of the economic base doesn't necessarily contribute. You know, there are, there are large area which uh, large areas which contributed to the economic base. They can't all contribute. They include areas that are too remote in terms of the steer judgment being too remote and ephemeral. And it's too, far too basic a, a rule to apply wholesale. You, you simply can't say that everything that was historically associated with a listed building contributes to its heritage significance. So in terms of what needs to be considered in order to get it in perspective, the, the first thing to consider is where is the significance of the building coming from? And in a very large number of listed buildings, the greatest amount of significance comes from the physical building itself with setting making a lesser contribution. If you think about significance as a pie, the majority of it is going to come from the physical building itself with only a slice coming from the setting. It's also useful to think about the current use of the farm buildings. Are they still in active use? Have they been converted to residential? Is farming actually taking place of the land or has the land ownership changed? A lot of change has occurred and, and this does have a bearing on whether stuff contributes to the significance of the asset. A very important issue is intervisibility. It's not the be all and end all, but it is definitely something which has a bearing on whether, some, whether a site contributes to heritage significance or not. Another issue to consider is how big the area that was historically associated with any one listed building was. Is an area of proposed greenfield development the entirety of the historic land holding? Or is it just a very small part of something which covers a much larger area? So that needs to be considered as well in order to get any one area into perspective. Something else to think about is how the character of the land itself has changed. Have the fields changed? Are they much larger than they were? Has there been a large degree of boundary loss? Is there anything that readily contributes in terms of pointing towards a particular type of agriculture and has that changed? Are the ridge and furrow earthworks, you know, that's something to be to be considered and something to seek specialist advice on because they are considered in a, in a very particular way. So usually, if you're looking at a listed farm building, usually a site will only be part of the setting. So you've got most of its significance intact unless you're proposing physical changes to the building itself as well. You're usually only part of the setting and the setting has usually experienced a large degree of change over time. And also the assets themselves may have changed over time. So all of those are issues that you can look at in terms of getting things into perspective as to how much any one site contributes and the level of harm that will result from a change in character of that area. What about churches, Gail? I mean, it used to be said in relation to wind farm <coughs> proposals when there were lots of those being considered that if you could, if you could see the wind, wind, wind turbine from a church then you're going to get refused permission. That was the sort of rule of thumb that one inspector certainly <laughs> um, <laughs> told me rather indiscreetly once. Um, what do you see the main issues in relation to churches and, and red, greenfield residential development at the moment? Well, that's something which is again certainly potentially problematic for greenfield developments and they're, again they're problematic for a few reasons. They're highly designated, um, over half of the uh, grade one listed buildings are medieval churches so a lot of them are very highly designated so of, of the highest level of significance as considered in the M MPPF. Also again most areas of, it, of, of the country especially where you'd be proposing greenfield housing development are related to churches obviously via parishes everything can be related back to particular buildings. 
they're designed to be prominent you know so many areas have views mm. to them because they were absolutely designed to be prominent and even where you can't see them you may be able to hear the bells or or have this documented association and also uh, rather simply they look good in views um you know people paint these views even worse people in the past painted views or if you're even more unlucky, somebody very famous in the past painted the views. So they, they look good and, and the disruption of these views is obviously a mechanism by which most people can understand that harm might occur very readily, which also makes them a big focus of uh, attention for potential objectors because you know everybody can understand if you're blocking the view of a church, it's a good thing to base an objection on. And there are lots of views across Greenfield sites However, the, there is an awful lot, again, that can be done to put things in perspective. You know, first and foremost, going back to the overall significance pie, um, a medieval church, unequivocally, most of its significance is in the fabric of the building, which obviously has huge historical architectural interest. And also they, they normally come with an area of immediate setting, which obviously makes a decent proportion of the contribution of setting to them. Most of them are in uh, setting graveyards and quite a lot have associated buildings with them too. So you're, you're moving down the hierarchy when you get to greenfield development. And the thing that absolutely has to be remembered in it is that churches were constructed to serve people in houses rather than the beasts in the fields. There is a lot said about uh, greenfield setting but the whole reason that they exist is to serve settlements and that really needs to be remembered when you're thinking about whether a greenfield area usually pretty remote contributes to heritage significance there are also usually a very large number of views of any one asset and it's worth looking at all the views to the asset to get in perspective whether any views across your site contribute or not um, and it's also worth thinking about the degree of change in any views that are across your site. Again, related to the issues that I mentioned before. So has there been a lot of boundary loss? Has there been intervening development? Has there been, you know, changes of agriculture? Anything of those uh, of that nature will mean that the, you know, the, the view of, has changed and experienced change in the past and perhaps has the capacity to absorb more change without necessarily affecting the significance of the asset. It's too simplistic to say that just because you can, there's intervisibility between a proposed development site and a church, therefore by definition, it's going to be harmful to some degree or other. That's, that's too simplistic, would you say? I, I certainly would. And the Historic England guidance on it in the setting of heritage assets appears to be coming at it with the same spirit. Um, without being derogatory, the phrasing in it is pretty tortuous when it comes to what it actually says about churches. But there is, there is an inset box on page 11, which is always worth referring to, which says, being tall structures, church towers and spires are often widely visible across land and townscapes. But where development does not impact upon significance of heritage assets visible in the wider setting or where not allowing significance to be appreciated, they're unlikely to be affected by small scale development unless that development competes with them, such as tower blocks and wind turbines may. Now it's a, it's a rotten sentence and I've never been able to read it in any way that makes plain sense. But I don't think I'm being unfair or misreading it when I say that the spirit is that if you're not really large scale in terms of height as tower blocks and wind turbines, then you're unlikely to be doing harm and that going back one stage surely agrees with the with what you just said of it is too simplistic to say just because you can see it it's going to cause harm it has to go beyond that it has to be doing something such as disrupting a particular historical association or challenging its dominance in a particular view and even if there is some harm it's not necessarily game over they are highly designated heritage assets, so obviously harm to very important buildings does weigh heavily in the planning balance. But there are a number of decisions and, and you know, a number of sites that we've been involved in where some smaller level of harm has been found to the church through changes in setting 
and that's found to be outweighed by the public benefits of the proposed scheme. So uh, I'll put them in the references at the end, but a scheme I was involved in in Takeley and a scheme my colleague Hannah Armstrong was involved in at Ambrose done um, two recent examples of, of where harm to a church has been outweighed by public benefits. What about conservation areas? Uh, mindful of the time, Gail. Okay. In, um, are they as much of a problem for green for residential development conservation areas as, as listed buildings can be? No, I don't think so. And the, the reason behind that is, first of all, change to its setting, the setting of a conservation area doesn't have the statutory mention. Its setting isn't explicitly mentioned in section 72 in sharp contrast to section 76, which of course deals with listed buildings. So that, that is a definite difference. And in terms of conservation areas, you know, very few of them are designated for matters relating to their setting. Their significance really very largely lies within the areas themselves, the character and appearance of that area. Um, so I think in, in terms of the balance of significance, and again, the, the kind of significance pie, it's generally speaking an even smaller slice of the pie um, that comes from setting most of the significance is embodied within the area itself. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much, Gail. We've got one very interesting question to you about regional quarrel. What I'm going to suggest is um, I'll let you um, cogitate on that question and we'll come back to it at the Q&A session at the end. Mm. Uh, and while you're um, thinking about region furrow, we're going to turn to Andy, who's going to um, discuss landscape and visual issues and some of the challenges um, posed by methodology. And Thanks, Ms. Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. So uh, what I'd like to uh, discuss today is uh, adopting a more positive approach to the nature of, in particular, visual effects when it comes to an LVIA. Um, we've heard from the MP, um, the, the Prime Minister, in terms of uh, Boris Johnson announcing a build, build, build agenda, uh, making it easier to build homes in an attempt to bolster the economy. Um, but even before COVID-19 and the lockdown, the government recognised that there was a significant shortfall in terms of housing, uh, where the supply was not meeting the demand. So we know that building houses is recognised as a, generally a good thing, uh, and it certainly brings homes and roofs to people in the local community, as well as uh, bringing economic benefits to um, the local uh, economies. Yet, what's interesting is that most applications for housing require LVIAs to be, uh, be provided. Now we're all familiar with the term landscape and visual impact assessment um, but it's quite unfortunate I think that we have a title such as that because it introduces the word impact in the title and generally the word impact has quite negative connotations. It's synonymous with other words such as collision, crash, collide, um, and it's interesting to see other specialist reports that don't actually use that word. They may be assessing effects, but they don't use the word impact, such as transport assessments, heritage appraisals, ecology reports, um, noise studies, for example. No reference to impact in the title. Um, so that's an unfortunate uh, element with regard to LVIAs. Now, LVIAs have their roots in the guidance and the guidance is the Landscape and Visual Impact Assessment, um, which was produced uh, by the Landscape Institute. It's referred to as GLIVIA. Um, it was produced in 2013, but it is still the current guidance. What's interesting is that whilst the Landscape Institute were instrumental in uh, being the author of the document, the, the document was also co-authored by the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment. And I, su I suspect that that particular institute had one eye on the EIA regs and that is why we have impact in the title now for, um, for these assessments. But it's interesting that in the preface to the Glivia document, it does emphasize the identification of significant environmental effects and to focus on the positive and the negative nature of effects and to encourage professionals to look at this particular aspect. Very helpfully, uh, the guidance goes on to note that in terms of looking at the term impacts and effects, paragraph 1.15 differentiates um, the terms to provide some 
clarification for practitioners. So with regard to impact, it's defined as the action being taken as opposed to the effect, which is defined as the change resulting from the action. Mm. Now, Glivia as a document um, addresses both the impacts upon the landscape as well as, well as impacts upon general visual amenity, um, the views, if you like. And in respect to both elements, it focuses on the nature of effects. This isn't the magnitude or the sensitivity, but the nature. So if I can give you a reference, um, with regard to effect upon landscape elements and landscape character, paragraph 537 is very helpful. And if I just read from that, it says, one of the more challenging issues is deciding whether the landscape effects should be categorized as positive or negative. It is also possible for effects to be neutral in their consequence for the landscape. And similarly, with regard to visual effects, this is set out in paragraph 6.29. And again, just to quote, an informed professional judgment should be made as to whether the visual effects can be described as positive or negative, or in some cases, neutral in their consequences for views and visual amenity. Now, it's interesting that in my experience, once you get involved with the project and you get, say, to public consultation stage, and you've got members of the public coming along to an exhibition, that the general consensus is that the general public don't like to see change in their locality, in their neighborhood. And if there is change, it's regarded as a bad thing rather than a good thing. And unfortunately, this sort of negative approach and attitude um, is seen elsewhere in the application uh, and consultation process, whether that might be uh, statutory or non-statutory consultees, it could be the case officer. Indeed, you see this sort of reaction from members of the planning committee. And so you end up with a situation where, in terms of effects upon visual amenity, there's just this automatic assumption that a development is going to have an adverse effect upon the local uh, visual amenity, the local environment. Now, as an expert witness, undertaking a lot of inquiry work, I, as you would expect, I have to review many LVIAs. And one of the things I focus upon is looking at what the LVIAs say about the nature of effect. Now, sometimes you do see um, positivity being introduced in terms of the nature of effect when it, become, when it relates to landscape elements, and those often relate to the site. So for example, if you're looking at the number of hedgerows that relate to the development, the chances are there may be an increase in the number of hedgerows being proposed, or there is a significant number of trees that are being added to the scheme, uh, added to the site as a consequence of the scheme. So you can start to see straight away that there is a, an increase in those resources, in those elements. And therefore you can understand how a practitioner, somebody writing an LVIA, might start to identify beneficial rather than adverse effects with regard to effects upon landscape elements as they relate to the site. But what's interesting is when you review the LVIAs with regard to effects upon visual amenity, it's very rare that an LVIA will take a positive stance with regard to effects upon visual amenity of an area. And I want to illustrate this by means of two examples. The first is a decision uh, by Christina Downs, this one here. Hopefully you can all see it, we'll uh, attach it later. Now, Christina Downs was involved with uh, an inquiry which is referred to as the, the CAVI decision. It's dated August 2017, but still relevant. And with regard to that scheme, if I just outline some of the key points, What's of particular note is that this was for redevelopment of the CAVI headquarters, and it also involved 91 dwellings in landscaped grounds. Now the appeal was allowed, um, but I would point this out to you, that it was within the AOMB and AOMB, the Chilterns in this case, and clearly in that scenario, great weight needs to be given to conserving and enhancing the landscape and scenic beauties we know, as in set out in paragraph um, 172 of the framework. Now, Christina Downs, the inspector, 
concluded that the Cavi building was attractive in appearance. She also noted that the residential element resulted in a high quality built environment and the whole scheme was wrapped in an attractive landscape setting. So these are all positive factors, aren't they? And this is against a baseline where the site made no contribution in terms of special qualities to the AOMB, had an institutional character with respect to the grounds. There was a general lack of management and maintenance with regard to the buildings and the grounds. And so it was just generally perceived as being in poor condition. So that's the baseline, which is a fairly poor position against an environment where we're proposing real um, benefits in terms of what is being proposed. Yet, in terms of the conclusions, um, the inspector noted there would be significant harm with respect to landscape and visual issues, that there would be a visual impact. Interesting um, that in the inspector's decision, it refers to visual impact rather than visual effects. But the visual impact would be moderate adverse at the outset of the project. So we've got all these, this quality scheme against a backdrop of a poor environment, a degraded environment, and yet the outcome is a moderate adverse effect at the, out, at the outset. And the inspector recognised that with the, the benefit of growth of the vegetation around the perimeter of the site, the visual effect would reduce. But by year 15, the conclusion is that there's a minor effect, but it's still minor adverse rather than beneficial. However, I would maintain that when you're looking at a quality residential scheme set within an attractive landscape framework, surely it is possible to enhance the visual amenity or at the very least avoid um, adverse vis visual effects. But this scenario sadly seems to be quite rare. However, I've managed to find a rare example of an appeal decision, how we were actually involved with it, where there is analysis with regard to landscape and visual effects, but no reference to harm to the landscape or visual amenity. And this is the second decision I'm going to refer to, which is this, this one here. Um, I refer to it as Milton under Witchwood, dated June 2018. Now the inspector here was Rachel Bust, and it was on behalf of Spitfire Homes, and it involved nine dwellings in a greenfield location on the edge of the settlement, um, together with some green infrastructure, some parkland around the, the nine properties proposed. Now, in this instance, the appeal was also allowed, and the main issue, not surprisingly, was the effect upon the character and the appearance of the local area. Again, within an A and B environment, in this case, the Cotswolds, now, the conclusions of the inspector here are really interesting because the inspector noted that the proposals would extend the built form of the settlement. However, the layout of the proposals would reflect the character, would reflect the character of the settlement and therefore would not be harmful. And also the use of materials would reflect the local built environment. The inspector noted that the rural character of the site would inevitably change to an urban character. Um, not surprisingly, um, but that the proposal in visual terms would always be seen in the context of the village. It was recognised that there were some local detractors in terms of the site's context, not dissimilar to Cabby. But interestingly, the proposed development was considered to enhance the setting of the village. And the inspector went further and noted in terms of the range of viewpoints, the closer the view to the proposal, the more the visual benefit would become apparent, which is really interesting. So the inspector concluded that the effect on character and appearance on the local area was considered acceptable. Such a decision is really encouraging uh, as it provides an example of change that would, have, that would come about with beneficial landscape and visual effects rather than adverse effects. So back to the, the current agenda of the government, build, build, build. Clearly the government has decided that development is a good thing and wants to see more of it. However, all of this is going to have to work through the planning system in the main uh, and secure consents to enable delivery. But this is going to require a change of mindset, I believe, for many decision makers uh, and information feeding into those so they can be in a position to make a fully informed decision. And that 
goes to LVIAs and the authors of those LVIAs. I think we need to take a more positive stance in our approach to change and recognize the benefits of sustainable development blended with green infrastructure when we're looking at quality design in placemaking. So I suppose if I have to conclude a key point, it's this, that we need to see more landscape assessment, assessment setting out the landscape and visual benefits of development rather than the adverse effects if we're going to drive the housing agenda for economic growth. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks, you made some really interesting points there. I mean, it, it seems to me that um, arguably the, the guidelines on LVIA um, are a little bit of a fudge, if, I'm, if I may be so rude, uh, because there's something in it for everybody. There's, there's um, passages that you've referred to which enable um, a, an informed judgment to be made as to whether a uh, change is one for the better or for the worse or, or yeah. equal. But then equally, um, we've all seen, as you allude to, um, uh, decision makers, consultants, inspectors take the approach that any new brick on green field is by definition harmful. And so the only question under the GPVA is how bad is it? Which doesn't sit very comfortably with us being told this is something that we need more of. Um, and, and do you think that um, there might be some advantages uh, in the government showing some leadership on this issue by making clear, for example, in updated PPG, planning practice guidance, that the landscape and visual effects of new greenfield development shouldn't automatically be treated as negative. And that if that was enshrined in national guidance, then um, Glivia would have to catch up much as the, the RICS guidance on financial viability has had to catch up with the PPG on viability. Um, do you think that leadership from government might be the, what's needed for that more positive approach that you refer to? I, I think it would certainly help. I just think that um, it is my experience that in terms of all the participants in a, in a planning project, you constantly see time and time again the, the negative stance that is taken towards landscape and visual effects as a consequence of development, particularly in terms of visual amenity, that there is this general consensus that if it's seen, it's in some way unacceptable. It's not acceptable that you can see it. And there's this always um, a, apologetic approach that we should be going about trying to screen development as much as possible, such that if it's totally visible, invisible, and out of uh, view, then that is, is made acceptable. That is an acceptable position. And it's a, a rather sad uh, indictment of where we're at, isn't it, as a, as a position in society in terms of the, the um, working in the, the, the built environment and the development sector, where there is this um, automatic assumption, if it's visible, it is therefore harmful. And indeed, I, I had first-hand experience of that, as, as you will recall, at a, an inquiry where we had an inspector uh, who interjected in my cross-examination to, mm. to raise the point when I was saying that this was going to be a quality scheme in a quality landscape in an OMB environment that was going to lead to uh, an environmental enhancement in the short, medium and longer term. And the inspector interjected and and said he couldn't possibly conceive of any scenario where there would be an enhancement uh, as a consequence of a, a, a modern residential development in a greenfield location, which I just thought w was such a, a, a myopic view. Um, but that is, you know, a situation that we see endemic in the in the sector, I believe. I mean, it, it's um, yeah. I mean, on that mindset, uh, uh, that particular inspector, a number of people would probably say that if. Um, if one was doing an LVIA now of Blenheim Palace, if it had been built from scratch, there'd be a major adverse impact uh, in, in yes. visual character terms. But, but I think what your, your message for, the, for people listening who, who may have kind of actual sites, actual is the tools are there if you look carefully enough in the glitter, it's just they're not used. They are. They are. That's and, and that's the reason why I give those paragraph reference numbers, because they're there, they're in the preface, they're in the introduction, they're in the landscape impact section, they're in the visual amenity section of the document but practitioners um, landscape planners like myself don't take up those cues those references very clear references and apply the tools uh, in a in a more forensic uh, logical clinical fashion there's Thanks. just a, a, there is this um, uh, very simple adoption of uh, let's just assume a worst case scenario and it's right to bear that in mind 
but the worst case scenario may not necessarily be adverse. Thanks, that, that's uh, really helpful. There's, there's one question for you, which again, as with Gail, I'll, I'll ask you to, to cogitate over that question and come back to it at the end. Uh, and meantime, we'll move on to, to Neil, who's going to discuss some of the hot topics in relation to housing and supply. Uh, afternoon, uh, Neil. Uh, I think the first thing you wanted to discuss was um, the review of the standard method. Yeah, um, it, it's probably useful to outline a bit of, a bit of context by way of introduction. Um, we should all know that in 2012, the government introduced the former MPPF and at that point abolished regional strategies. Now, the former MPPF identified that local authorities were free to determine their own objectively assessed need and didn't provide any prescriptive method for doing that. Now, inevitably, different LPAs adopted different and inconsistent methodologies to determine their need. And I'm sure we've all been in situations where authority A has said, the migration flows assumed to come to this authority aren't real and will not happen. And then you go to authority B and they say, oh yeah, the flows will be maintained and therefore both authorities argue that their need is lower than, than that which actually makes sense as a sum of the two. So as a result of the former MPPF, the cumulative need was never recognised and therefore was not responded to in the, in, in the plan-led system. The government appeared to recognise that through the introduction of the standard method in the current MPPF, which provides a consistent basis and ensures that um, across the piece the, the needs should be met. However, the standard method has been subject to numerous criticisms, and most particularly the fact that it only actually provides for 200, well, circa 266,000 homes per annum, which is less than the national need identified by the government for 300,000 homes per annum. Now, so it's entirely unsurprising that both under the former MPPF and the current MPPF, the plan-led system just hasn't been enabled to, to respond to the national housing need. And therefore, if we stick rigidly with the plan-led system, we will just never deliver a sufficient number of homes. Now, that appears to have been acknowledged by the government, as they've identified that the standard method is an urgent need of review to ensure that it does now identify a figure for 300,000 homes per annum as identified in planning for the future. Now we understand that it will be a matter of months, probably by September, that the new standard method will come in. And indeed Pegasus Group are actively engaged with a group of consultancies, a number of barristers and QCs to seek to influence uh, government officials as to quite how that new standard method should, should stack up. Um, but given that the standard method is almost certainly going to change in the very near future, that's going to have a very significant effect for all, well, for, uh, yeah, very probably all local planning authorities, both for plan making and decision taking. If the MPPF remains as is, but the PPG changes to reflect the new standard method, every local planning authority that has a housing requirement which is more than five years old would then have to take account of the new standard method and given that it's likely to be a higher figure in at least the majority of LPAs those LPAs will have a lower five-year land supply position and um, that's probably one of the two hot topics on land supply at the minute this this ch imminent change to the standard method impossible to predict at the minute but uh but watch this space um, Neil turning to the supply side um and the perennial debates we have at five year supply inquiries about the deliverability of, of specific sites. Um, there's been a recent consent order, as I'm sure most of the people, if not all, uh, on this Zoom um, uh, call will um, be aware about the, the definition of deliverable in the 2019 framework, which um, sets out two categories of, of, of deliverable sites. And um, the Secretary of State has consented to judgment uh, accepting. Uh, the argument of the East Northamptonshire Council that that's not a closed list so that you, uh, you can have a deliverable site which doesn't fall within um, subcategories A or B of the definition of deliverable. Um, what's your take on this Neil? You were involved in the case weren't you? I, I was and, and, and there's a lot of context which didn't come through in the consent order but uh, we haven't got time to go through that now. Um, I continued and as the council accepted actually at that hearing that the definition can only be read to provide a closed list. 
Uh, and indeed that's explicit in the PPG. It's the consistent finding of virtually every Section 78 inspector that's dealt with this matter. It's the approach endorsed by numerous LPAs. And yet out of the blue, contrary to the wording of the definition, the PPG and the interpretation of at least the overwhelming majority of, of decision takers, the Secretary of State has, has uh, set out this alternative and slightly incomprehensible position within the consent order. Um, now, unsurprisingly, I don't think that's a supportable position. And I know there's a long line of barristers and QCs ready to challenge on this on this ground. Who included Charlie? Um, if if it ever becomes determinative as to whether or not it's a closed list for an appeal. Um, but if we take the Secretary of State's position as read for just one moment, that not only would it is it contrary to all of the guidance and the interpretation of everybody, um, it's also directly contrary to the intended simplification of the MPPF, which was the one of the objectives of the MPPF. We're now going to waste huge amounts of time at appeals discussing whether or not it is a closed list, um, and appeals are necessarily going to take that much longer. A point that always occurred to me as well, which I don't think was, was something the Secretary of State seems to grapple with in that consent order, is if you've got a site which doesn't have planning permission and which isn't an allocation, then it falls in the definition of windfall. Uh, and it seems to me fairly obvious from the structure of the framework and the housing policies in the framework that something can't be a windfall and also a livable site. The two are by definition, by necessarily exclusive. And that's a pretty good indication to my mind that it's a closed list, leaving aside the wording of the definition. But who are we to tell the Secretary of State? Um, exactly. uh, what, what about clear evidence? We know now that um, the definition tells us that for sites um, which uh, have outlined permission for major development um, uh, or allocated but don't have permission or permission in principle or brownfield register, they should only be deliverable where there's clear evidence that completions will begin on site within five years. How do you see that affecting the evidential onus on authorities um, to prove that those sites should go in their five year supply? Well, actually, on this matter, I think there's fairly little to say because the existence of clearer evidence or not falls pretty much entirely to planning judgment of the individual decision taker. Um, the PPG does provide a list of examples of what may include, what clear evidence may include. Now, from reading it, that means that you could actually have all of those evidence and that still might not provide the clear evidence required by the MPPF. Um, but it does fall to a matter of, uh, of planning judgment. M my personal opinion, looking at the the examples provided in the PPG is that as a minimum you need some written correspondence with a site representative which identifies the barriers that remain to be overcome, how and when those will be overcome, the start date there afterwards and the, the, the delivery rate following on from that. Thanks and um, what about the um evidence that post dates the base dates at the moment mo most five-year supply assessments as things stand now are based on a first of april 2019 base i think there's a few 2021s trickling through but most of them are first of april 2019 um and and the um, issues come up for example to what what relevance is covid which of course didn't exist in um as of the 1st of April 2019, is that relevant to five-year supply uh, as of the 1st of April 2019? Were sites deliverable as of that date? Other issues, as you know, local authorities seek to bolster their supply, uh, or bolster their evidence by after the base date, saying, well, here's evidence, further evidence of, of the site moving forward. Is that relevant to the question of, is this site deliverable as of the 1st of April 2019? How do you, you take into account, or do you not take into account, um, post base state evidence. I should apologise for the doorbell. It might go repeatedly now because nobody's... Yeah, I've called me on my landline three times. I can't work out how to unplug the phone. So <laughs> you're in good company. <laughs> um, as, as far as I see it, it largely comes to a, the construction of the MPPF, the definition. Yeah. Um, it's largely been taken in, in one of two ways by different people. Either it requires that sites were available at the base state, offered a suitable location at the base state, and there was, real, there was clear evidence that they would deliver within five years at the base date. Or on the alternative side, they were 
available at the base state, suitable at the base state, and there's clear evidence that they will deliver in five years from the base state, including taking account of newly arising evidence. Now, actually, um, I subscribe to the latter, the latter interpretation, namely that you can take account of newly arising evidence. And that's the position adopted by numerous inspectors, including recently by the Secretary of State in the Woburn Sands decision. And it's consistent with the fact that as a matter of necessity, when dealing with appeals, appellants have always had the advantage of being able to introduce newly arising evidence because they weren't there at the base state to consider the position at that point. So in order to provide equity, I think that makes eminent sense. Um, however, there are a few caveats. Um, when assessing the deliverable supply, it's clearly necessary to, to take account of the evidence available to you at that point. Um, so it doesn't mean that a council can just make up a deliverable supply and then retrospectively run away and get it. They've got to assess the supply on the basis of the evidence available at any particular point and supplement that as, as newly arising evidence comes forth. Um, the other thing um, is that because you're still only dealing with sites which were available and suitable at the base date, you can only take account of evidence which related to those. So in accordance with the findings of new, numerous inspectors, including the Secretary of State at Woburn Sands, that it excludes taking account of newly arising sites because those weren't suitable or available at the base date. Indeed, a site that was subject to an outstanding planning application at the base date was clearly not suitable. If it was suitable, the council would have granted planning permission at the base date. They hadn't because they were unable to say it was suitable and therefore you can't retrospectively add that to the supply. So is it fair to summarise it in this way, that post base date evidence is, is relevant, provided that it's probative of whether the site was deliverable as of the base date? Um, yes, yes, in effect. Yeah, thanks. And what about, what about coronavirus? Um, our <laughs> most topical issue, um, uh, relevant, I know, to a number of, of, of fields, and Dave is going to come back to this to a degree, but how do you see the relevance of the, corona, the effects of coronavirus in terms of stalled sites, delayed sites, etc., on de housing delivery? Yeah, so this is the other, the other big, the big topic at the minute. Um, I, I mean, it's inevitable, unarguable, that... Um, coronavirus and the lockdown will not have an adverse effect on delivery. Um, a number of smaller developers have gone into administration. There have been delays to local plans, both gathering evidence, consultations and examinations. There's been delays to the surveys necessary to bring sites forward and to progress local plans. Um, there have been delays to applications, including in response to the economic uncertainty and the delays to surveys and as a result of, of staff being put on furlough. Um, there have been delays to the determination of applications, including for discharge of conditions, reserve matters, every sort of application, while planning authorities have diverted their resources to other, to other sectors. There have been delays to the appeals, which are a necessary part of the supply chain. There are viability implications arising from the longer lead-in times now expected. There are delays to pre-commencement works. There are delays to commencement of developments. There are some sites which had commenced will have shut down for the short term. Um, there will then be the effects of social distancing on delivering sites. And there's the potential for supply chain bottlenecks as well. So a series of, well, some of those will be significant, but a series of even insignificant things like that will have very pronounced effect on the number of completions achieved. And very interesting how, how, how much is knocked off. I mean, Christina Downs in the Nine Mile Ride case in Wokingham a couple of months ago, I think the first one to deal with Chrome, she knocked off about half a year's supply. Seems to me quite possible that future decisions will chop off significantly more in some authorities due to the effects of COVID. Yeah, uh, I mean, it will vary from LPA to LPA because it depends upon the status of the individual sites and how, quite how the developer or site representative have, have responded to, to lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, there, there will be varying effects. But um, as a result of the lower completions that will be achieved, it's inevitable that the housing delivery test will be adversely affected come November, mm -hmm. and that will then follow through for a number of years. Mm -hmm. 
there's likely to be a greater backlog of need to be addressed within five years using the Sedgefield approach or, or over a longer period using the Liverpool approach. Um, the effects of COVID will have to be reflected in clear evidence in support of sites. So the deliverable supply is also likely to be adversely affected, not only the completions at present. And furthermore, it's often used as context, uh, historic lead-in times and delivery rates are no longer representative of the current situation. As a result of COVID, with, with um, social distancing in particular, historic delivery rates and lead-in times will be adversely affected. Whilst yeah. that still provides a context of a very aspirational picture of what could happen, the rates that are actually achieved realistically will be significantly worse than that in the past. For example, for the, for the first year of a housing stretch at least until somebody finds a vaccine or some other way to deal with COVID uh, what you're saying is that the standard typical build rates need to be adjusted downwards. Well it depends how long social distancing goes on for um, they will continue to be adversely affected as long as social distancing remains in place. Well, let's hope it's not five years. <laughs> um, anything else you'd like to say Neil about um, weight to be given out of all these considerations weight to be given to um, the, the supply uh, contribution to the supply of housing that new residential development proposals would generate? Yeah well I mean we we all know that we're in the midst of a housing crisis um, so in the tilted balance any adverse effect that's sufficient to over and sorry to outweigh the benefits of delivering housing that households needs and to providing the economic stimulus to the economy required to in the current circumstance those harms would have to be very significant i would suggest um and i'm sure that will be picked up by mr hutchison in a moment Brilliant. Well, thanks so much, Neil, um, for those interesting thoughts. Um, David, um, really picking up where Neil left off um, and the planning balance, um, what, what do you see as the, the sort of topical issues in related to how the, the planning balance is exercised in a uh, typical greenfield housing case? Yeah, I'll, I'll pick those up. Obviously, as a policy um, witness, I would have to pull together all the different strands and deal with the overall planning balance. Now, if we were dealing with unallocated sites, we'd be typically talking about the tilted balance and, and trying to get that engaged. Now, I think it's fair to say that's not the silver bullet that people thought it was when it first came in. Um, it's much more nuanced now following all the litigation that's followed. And it doesn't mean that out-of-date policies should be afforded um, no weight. Um, some policies might be afforded full weight, and that, that was held in the Crane judgment. Um, weight's obviously a matter for the decision maker, and that then brings in areas of judgment. It's not just a binary um, position you find yourself in. We then have issues like heritage that Gail has to deal with, another footnote six policies where councils might try to um, bring into the discussion to try and disapply the tilted balance. And I think what's important regardless of whether it's tilted balance or not, is not to lose sight of the primacy of the development plan. I think recent decisions over the last sort of six months or so have tried to re-establish that the government doesn't want an appeal-led process. Um, so even when you're in that tilted balance, I'm trying to make sure that the case that's being run is, is, is something which aligns as much as possible to the development plan. So you might not be an allocated site, but are you the right location broadly in the spatial strategy terms? and also whether the um, adverse effects can be minimized. Then we're obviously putting the onus on the local authority to demonstrate whether those significant adverse effects um, outweigh the benefits, um, I'm sorry, whether those adverse effects significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits, that's the 11D test. But again, it's also important not to assume that you've got to um, try and get into the tilt balance. You can still go through the 11C route, which is accord with the development plan, um, without delay, even if you're on an allocated site. And I think one of the important judgments that came out recently was the Cornwall judgment, or Corbett as it's known as, and that hasn't necessarily rewritten anything. It's just reminded us that you can have a development plan that has policies which pull in different directions. And what the job is of the, the decision maker is to make an overall assessment and to judge whether overall the proposal accords with the plan or not. And we've got an example of a case that I dealt with in Fiddington. It was following a call and inquiry. It was um, allowed in January of this year. That was a scheme of 850 houses. It was unallocated. It was a site where um, the development plan was saying that strategic sites had to be identified through a review of the JCS. 
uh, we didn't accord with the housing policy of the plan and our affordable housing was um, 35% rather than 40%, which was applied to windfall schemes. But what we were able to show in that case was this was a scheme that aligned very well with the spatial strategy. It was a plan that had a strategic housing shortfall. We were a strategic site and we were in exactly the right location. So when the Secretary of State came to conclude on that um, application and stroke appeal, um, he did find that there was conflict with a number of policies, but the overall conclusion was that accorded with the development plan when read as a whole. So again, that's an 11C case rather than 11D. There's also another example um, about two weeks ago, I had a site in Corby where the council have resolved to grant permission. Again, an allocated site, it's 4 million square foot of logistics floor space. Um, it's on the edge of the town. The council have concluded on that case that there would be conflict with some policies, but when you read the plan as a whole, again, there would be compliance overall. So again, back to 11C on an unallocated site. The other interesting um, one which I'd raise is those policies which are often included in development plans where they virtually repeat the presumption in favour of sustainable development. Now, most people ignore this because they think that the councils just tick the box by making sure that the plans have regard to this, this important statement. But if we were to look to the CABI decision, which Andy referred to earlier on, um, I can't take credit for this one. It was a Guy Wakefield case that he did, did with you, Charlie. And here there was a case where there was conflict with a number of policies, but the tilted balance was engaged. The proposal passed the tilted balance, and what Christina Downs did in that case is she said, well, I've got this policy, whether it's S1 normally in most plans, and said, well, that tells me I've got to approve the scheme if you pass the tilt of balance. So the overall conclusion in that case was despite a number of conflicts, the scheme actually accorded with the development plan as a whole. So back again to the, the 11C approach. In terms of the, the sort of routes into the tilt of balance, it's very clear from decisions, you don't need to have multiple routes into the tilt of balance to, to get there, one is enough. And, and normally five year supply would be the binary approach that most people would go for, but it's always worth having backup cases. Um, it may be the case that the five year supply is marginal and you may lose that argument and therefore you need another reason why um, the tilt of balance could be engaged. So the other main route that, um, you would seek to go down is whether the most important policies that are relevant to that application or appeal are out of date or not. Now clearly the change in the MPPF was trying to avoid a situation where people were trying to argue we've got one marginal policy which is out of date and therefore that engages the tilt of balance and, and, and away we go. So what we now have is the Wavenden judgment um, and what this is telling us is that you have to identify the most important policies, you put those in the little baskets and you try and work out whether that basket of policies overall um, are, are out of date or not. Now, I'm finding in committee reports, councils keep on referring to the Wavenden judgment, but they seem to be misunderstanding exactly what it means. And I think the one key area for that is trying to avoid the situation where it can only be the disputed policies. And you and I had a case, Nickford, last year with, with Carla, and that was a case where it was essentially agreed that the housing requirement was out of date, the spatial strategy was out of date, the policy on rural housing was out of date, even the heritage policy was out of date because it didn't have the 196 balance in it. And what the council said is, well, if the policies are out of date, they can't be the most important policies, so we exclude those ones. Now, that's clearly illogical because how could you have a test that's asking you to try and find are the most important policies out of date if you've excluded the, all the out of date ones? So luckily in that case, that was one where a consultant had, over, had taken over the project and agreed all of this on the morning of the inquiry. But it's still important to realize that, you know, councils are, are still trying to fight back on those, those sorts of points. A topical area that I've, I've been dealing with recently is paragraph 71 applications in the MPPF and these are the entry-level housing schemes which can, which can be allowed next to um, settlements if they meet a number of, of criteria. Now I'm finding that councils are reluctant to grant these because they see these as a bit of an affront to the development plan process where schemes that wouldn't normally be allowed are, are now being allowed. But what's quite important in the guidance is to note that it's the onus is on the council in that case to demonstrate that the need for these houses is already being met. Now, I can't think of many authorities across the country where the need for entry level housing 
isn't going to be clear and, and demonstrable. And what you've also got to look at is that the, the guidance is saying that you could be one or more categories in the affordable housing definition at, at the back of the MPPF. So the other issue that we're finding is that councils are, are trying to argue, well, there's no local need. You haven't identified a need for this particular village. But it's important to read the guidance and, and what it's saying there is whether the need is being met across the district. It's not saying whether it's for that settlement or not. So the fact that a number of these local plans have predated this part of the MPPF is going to mean that most of them are going to have spatial strategies, settlement boundaries, rural exception policies, which are not going to allow for these schemes. They're going to preclude those schemes. So in, in those cases, I'd be arguing the most important policies are going to be out of date. Tilted balance would be engaged. And that's in addition to the fact that the guidance itself says government uh, or local authorities should be supporting these schemes. If I sort of move on briefly to the sort of benefits that we put in the planning balance, I don't intend to go through all of them because they're going to depend on particular schemes, but economic benefits are going to be a topical issue, like you've just said about COVID-19. The MPPF already says at paragraph 80 that we've got to give significant weight to economic growth. But I found that that tended to be watered down quite a lot in decisions the further away that we got from the recession where people were saying well that was when the credit crunch was happening but we're, we're, we've moved away from that. But I think it's fair to say that that guidance is probably as important now as it ever was um, but for, for reasons unexplained to me so far uh, authorities are, are quite reluctant to acknowledge COVID-19 and I've got a recently signed statement of common ground for a live appeal and just to sort of illustrate some of the points and these are matters that are in dispute. So we've got there, the appellant believes that COVID-19 lockdown will have further negative effect on the council's five-year housing land supply position. The local authority does not agree. So like you said, look to the Wokingham decision with Christina Downs where she's already um, indicated and that was back in March. The next one, whilst the full impact of the pandemic is yet to be realised, the appellant considers that it's already had a severe impact on the economy and the need to support economic recovery through planning decisions is a very important material consideration. The local authority does not agree. And then the last one, the appellant considers that increased unemployment is to be expected as a result of COVID-19. This will reduce the ability for people to afford their own homes and will place pressure on the need for more affordable housing. The local authority doesn't agree. Now, I'm obviously not going to comment on this with it being a live appeal, but it does contrast quite a lot with what Boris is telling us and, and why we need to be concerned about the economy post-COVID. So we'll, we'll see what the inspector has to say. Like how much? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So the other one is about housing. And, and Neil's already touched upon that. And, and wait, I've got a case where council doesn't have a five-year supply um, and they only afford moderate weight to the housing as a benefit. And they say that the shortfalls are marginal, even though there's 800 plus units in that shortfall. What I'm also finding is councils are, are trying to temper the weight that's afforded to the benefit. And what they do is they introduce the adverse effects when you're looking in isolation just at the benefits. So what they say is, well, it's a, it normally would be afforded more weight, but this has heritage impacts or this has landscape impacts. And what that's doing is it's double counting the harm because what you're doing is you're tempering the benefit, then you're going to give full weight to all the adverse effects when you put them in the mix for your overall balance. So I, I think that's something that you, you've got to watch out for. The other point is that they often say, well, alternative sites might be able to deliver this without the harm. And that loses complete sight of the fact that if you haven't got five years supply, there are no alternative sites and therefore you can't sort of claim that, that approach. Similarly, small to medium sized sites, they say, well, you're not gonna make much of a dent on the, on the shortfalls and therefore, you know, it's not something that we want to uh, give much weight to. And that case was, was run initially in evidence on a, a case that we dealt with in Cheltenham earlier this year. But we looked at the evidence, 95% of the council sites were 25 units or less. So they were clearly making an important contribution. And we then looked at paragraph 68 of the MPPF and that talks also about small to medium sized sites making an important contribution that talks about how they're going to be built out quickly. So I suppose it returns back to that point that Neil was raising. We are in the middle of a national housing crisis. It's got worse with, with the situation that we, we find ourselves in economically as well. So even if a council has a five year supply, it's still capable of attracting very significant weight. 
and you'll be aware of the Litchfield decision, which has always brought out 750 houses, an allocated site. Council had a five-year supply and Secretary of State said very substantial weight. So if I just turn briefly to the adverse effects, um, quite often loss of countrysides raised against schemes, but isn't that inevitable on, in, in most authorities where they don't have the previously developed land available and if they don't have the five-year supply? We've got the issue of heritage, which, as I said, it's a common theme, particularly in sort of village locations. It tends to be, um, become um, quite a significant issue. Um, but again, it comes back to that point where the benefits of a scheme are certainly capable of outweighing that less than substantial harm, even when you uh, pay full regard to the importance of heritage and decision making. And quite often what we're finding is councils tend to overplay the harm and, and they, they say, well, this is at the upper end of the, um, the spectrum. Um, but again, that just really comes back to the importance of evidence and, and properly going through that. We've had recent cases at Ickford and Fleckney where those sorts of arguments were ran and, and the inspector didn't support them. And then finally, on adverse effects, it's the issue of conflict with the development plan. Should this go into the tilted balance as an issue or not? Now, I would say that it shouldn't be included, and, and other people are championing this argument at the moment as well, because that would be something that would be seen as, again, double counting the development plan. The whole purpose of the tilted balance is trying to establish whether you have a material consideration which justifies a departure from the development plan. So in dealing with your tilted balance, if you've already dealt with the development plan, and then you apply it again in the usual 38.6 approach, then you've double counted the development plan. So I think that's something that ought to be removed from adverse effects. And finally, for, for sort of topical issues I, I'd raise now is just about neighbourhood planning. Um, clearly it's an obstacle to unallocated sites in, in applications and appeals. But I think what we've got to um, bear in mind at the moment is the fact that many of those neighbourhood plans are starting to now age. Many of them are gonna be beyond the two years that are referenced in, in MPPF paragraph 14. Um, not all of them even have allocations, so those protections that they once had about having a three-year housing land supply threshold are not necessarily going to apply moving forward. Thanks very much, David. Um, well, before we turn to uh, the Q&A, uh, I'm just going to outline a few of the uh, key legal hot uh, topics at the moment concerning the termination of greenfield residential applications and appeals. And the first point I wanted to touch upon really was to pick up what David said about ensuring that you consider making the case that the proposed development is in accordance with the development plan and you don't need to then worry about the tilted balance. And there's two particular issues to bear in mind when putting together a case that an unallocated greenfield development is in accordance with the development plan. Uh, the first issue to consider is, is the principle of accordance to the plan as a whole, as David mentioned. Um, in other words, conflict with one or more individual plan policies doesn't preclude a finding of accordance with the plan as a whole for the purpose of section 38.6. And, and David mentioned, um, there's been a recent judgment on this, which I just wanted to explore briefly, Corbett and Cornwall uh, from April 2020, uh, which really highlighted the reach of this plan as a whole principle. And that was a case concerning 15 static holiday caravans and 15 holiday lodges extending an existing holiday park in Cornwall in an area of great landscape value. Uh, there was some limited harm to AGLV identified um, and strictly speaking that was meant that it was, in a, it was conflict with policy because policy 14 of the local plan said developments will not be permitted, mandatory, will not be permitted that cause harm to AGLV, whatever the amount. But another policy, policy five, provided support for upgrading existing tourism features, which is what this was doing. And what the council did is they granted permission on the basis that overall uh, the proposal was in accordance with the development plan, despite the policy 14 conflict. And Lord Justice Lindbom in the Court of Appeal said the council had been entirely entitled to do that. Uh, he said that the unqualified wording of policy 14, namely that harm to AGLV will not be permitted, didn't mean that that policy had automatic primacy so that if you breach that policy, by definition, you're not in accordance with the plan. It was permissible for the council to take the view that the balance of development plan policies, the internal tug of war, if you like, within development plan, fell in favour of uh, the proposal and therefore there was accordance. So even where there's conflict with a policy that contains mandatory language, development will not be permitted if dot dot dot, you can still be in accordance to the plan as a whole. Equating conflict with one policy is automatically mean there's a breach of the development plan is, is a leap of logic. 
Um, second uh, issue to consider in when looking at quarters of the plan is, is to be mindful of section 38.5 of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act 2004. It's not a very well known provision and what it says is that um, where you've got um, a conflict between uh, two different policies within a development plan um, but the policies are in different development plan documents then the conflict must be resolved, no discretion, legally must be resolved in favour of the policy that's in the last DPD to become part of the development plan. Um, and that's quite a useful tool where, uh, as I have seen on a number of occasions, there are, are two extant policies covering the same territory, one in an older save local plan, which is more restrictive, and one in a later, so more up-to-date one. And an example that um, I, I've come across a few times in Exeter, where um, they, certainly the last time I was there about a year ago, they had uh, an extant, still extant local plan from I think the early 2000s, maybe the 1990s, um, which had a policy LS1 covering the landscape setting of Exeter. And it, it basically prohibited any non-agricultural residential development in the landscape setting of Exeter, which is broadly speaking the countryside beyond the Greenbelt. Um, CP16, policy CP16 of the core strategy, covered the same territory, namely landscape setting, and it required an assessment of impact, or effects, sorry Andy, I should say, effects, not impacts, um, to determine whether residential development in the landscape setting was acceptable. So two policies covering the same ground, one more permissive than the other, and the argument I put forward was, uh, with, with success, was that if you satisfy CP16, uh, then even if you breach LS1, LS1, that doesn't matter because LS1 must give way because the two conflict and CP16 is the more recent. So that could also be a, 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 a provision that's helpful where you've got a restrictive neighbourhood plan that's followed by a more permissive district-wide uh, local plan uh, in those areas where neighbourhood plans got in first before local plans. So don't forget section 38.5. My next um, theme is, is the gateways to the tilted balance. I mean we all know that Broadly speaking, the gateways are, is there less than five year housing and supply? Is the relevant housing delivery test threshold um, uh, not complied with? Are the most important policies out of date for, for other reasons? Uh, or are there no relevant policies? And I just want to touch on some of those issues. So um, the less than five year housing and supply gateway to the tilted balance was something that was covered in the recent judgment in the Oxton Farms and Harrogate case by the Court of Appeal um, a few weeks ago. That was a challenge to a permission by Harrogate for 21 new homes on an unallocated greenfield site and it was granted in accordance with the uh, case officer's report which said that the council could only demonstrate a 5.02 year supply uh, and the officer said this isn't sufficiently above the five year supply that paragraph 11 of the framework can be ignored. And Lord Justice Lewison, in his judgment of the Court of Appeal, reiterated that the tilted balance is only and can only ever be engaged on housing supply grounds if there's a less than five year supply. He said that either there is a five year supply or there isn't. And if there is, then the tilted balance is not engaged on that basis. It doesn't matter whether the supply exceeds five years by a little or a lot. So the tilted balance can only be applied for five housing land supply reasons where the land supply would be over five years. Um, Turning then to the uh, where the most important policies are out of date for the reason. Well, David has dealt with the Wavendon case about uh, what are the most important policies, that basket approach. I just want to look at what out of date means in this context. And in the same case, the Oxton Farms and Harrogate case from, from last month, Lord Justice Lewison uh, made clear that five year supply shortfall isn't the only way uh, policies can be out of date. And he said this, a policy may be out of date because of a change in national policy or because of things that have happened on the ground, or for some other reason. So a very broad definition of how policies might be out of date. Uh, and he's held on the facts of, of that particular case. The council was justified in having a non-housing supply basis for hot, apply the tilted balance on out of date grounds, because, and this is quoting from the judgment, in order to maintain the supply of housing land, greenfield sites were needed and that meant settlement boundaries were out of date. In other words, um, the, there was a five-year supply in that case, but that was despite the local plan, not because of it. 
the local plan, the, the council was having to tolerate breaches of local plan settlement boundaries in order to have a five year supply. For that reason, the, the plan was out of date. And he also said that there's a further reason why the council is entitled to apply the tilted balance for the out of date reason, which is that the housing policies were based on an out of date target. Uh, and that was also a reason for um, finding that the housing policies were out of date. So if in, in, in a particular area, um, the most important policies include policies which are inconsistent with national policy uh, or um, they, they are um, holding up development which is agreed to be necessary to achieve a five year supply um, and therefore they're affecting the breaches of them are being tolerated to have a five year supply pipeline or if there are housing targets are out of date then the tilt of balance may apply even if there is a five year supply. I then want to talk about the no relevant policies gateway into the tilted balance. The, the, the successor to the, the former um, development plan is absent or silent uh, gateway in the old 2012 framework, paragraph 14. Now, taken literally, there'll almost always be a relevant policy, be it on SUDS, for example, or, or something really mundane and, and straightforward. Um, surely um, that's not enough. Because if, it, if so, then uh, that, mean, that really deprives the no relevant policies gateway of any, any real meaningful effect. Well, as a first instance judgment of Mr. Justice Oosley in the Paul Newman New Homes versus Secretary of State case from September last year, uh, where uh, Mr. Justice Oosley held that mundane policies were um, uh, capable of being relevant policies. So he said mundane policies are applicable to sort of them proposed even if they're not remotely controversial in application, such as the provision of adequate access or adequate sewage, uh, were things which could be relevant policies in this context. And as long as there was one of them, this gateway to the tilted balance was shut. Now that case is going to appeal. Um, it's going to be heard quite soon. Um, and I think it will be interesting to see um, how the Court of Appeal decides it. Because to my mind, given that the tilted balance is meant to be a default mechanism for where the local plan isn't fit for purpose in relation to the application under question. It seems to me that uh, this is a far too narrow reading of no relevant policies. My view is that the proper approach is that is to look, look at whether there are relevant policies on the most important issues relating to the application. If there are no relevant policies on the most important issues, uh, for example, in relation to the category of development, if there are no housing policies because they've been quashed by the High Court, or in relation to location of development, such as in South Oxfordshire, where for a while there was a, a core strategy anticipating a DPD for certain areas, the DPD didn't come forward, there was a vacuum. That's the kind of situation where I think it would be legitimate to say uh, there were no relevant policies on the most important issues. Um, we'll see if the Court of Appeal agrees later this year. Um, I'm going to turn now to the application of the tilted balance. Um, David has already alluded to the fact that the High Court, Mr Justice Holgate, in the Gladman case in March 2020, um, famously held that in considering whether there are adverse impacts that significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits when applying the tilted balance, um, breaches of the development plan can be had regard to as adverse impacts. I, I share David's view that seems to be double counting because the whole point of the tilted balance is you're working out whether there are effectively material considerations in the tilted balance to outweigh the breach of the development plan. So counting them both sides is double counting an impact or a harm. Um, but the High Court disagreed. Um, uh, it, it said even where the development plan policies are out of date and their out of dateness is the very reason why the tilted balance applies as the default where the development plan isn't fit for purpose even then they can be applied in the, in the tilted balance now that's also the subject of an ongoing appeal and uh, it's got permission to appeal so it'd be very interesting to see whether the court of appeal um, upholds that and another case a third relevant case um, relating to the tilted balance going to appeal one of mine monk hill um, a, a bit of a sore point between Andy and, Andy and me because the one time where I was against Andy and had to cross-examine uh, uh, Andy and uh, I'm afraid I came second and, and Andy got the, the gold medal on that particular occasion um, but um, my clients challenged that case um, and the issue was um, the uh, disapplication of the tilted balance under paragraph 11d1 of the MPPF where there are policies that protect areas or assets of particular importance, which provide a clear reason for refusal. Now, this was a case which was not major development, um, but it was in the AONB. So it wasn't subject to the exceptional circumstances tests, but it was subject to the provision in paragraph 172 of the framework that great weight should be given to the landscape and scenic beauty of the AONB. 
Um, now that's a bit different to say the exceptional circumstances test or very special circumstances for green belt, which impose effectively a more demanding test. This is simply saying give great weight to one particular factor. And what the inspectors is, he, he said that provided a clear reason for refusal and disapplied the tilted balance because we, there was no five year supply in Waverley in that case. And Mr. Justice Holway said that was, um, that was an appropriate interpretation. Our argument, which we've got permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal on, is that a, a giving great weight to one factor can't of itself provide a clear reason for refusal. It's telling you how to apply impact on the A and B in the tilted balance for non-major development. Um, but you don't know whether there's a reason for refusal until you weigh all the other policies in and paragraph 172 isn't dealing with that. So it doesn't provide a clear reason for refusal. Uh, if the High Court's judgment is upheld, it's a fairly broad interpretation of the disapplication of tilted balance um, under paragraph 11D1. So um, those voting development in, in, for example, A, O and B um, will be hoping that that appeal is, is upheld. Uh, and finally, just a sentence on section 38.6. Uh, um, I mean, if, if you haven't got to show accordance with the development plan and you haven't got to get through the tilted balance, then plainly section 38.6 is your last resort. Um, it's not plainly going to be a taller um, order to persuade an inspector or a decision maker to grant permission as a, on the basis of other material considerations indicating otherwise in accordance with the plan in, in, if you can't rely on a tilted balance. But it's not impossible. Um, there are a number of cases um, where that has succeeded. One of the ones, one of my favourites, probably would be, wouldn't it? Because one, uh, one of mine was Barclay, uh, Bug Development, Persimmon Home Development next to Barclay Castle. I think it was about 300 homes, give or take. Um, there was a five-year supply. There was some heritage harm, but due to the, um, the nonetheless significant weight to be given to housing, affordable housing issues and economic benefits, the inspector held that um, there were considerations which both outweighed the breach of the development plan and also for public benefits outweighing the heritage harm. Um, I think it's fair to say that if you're in section 38.6 territory you're far more dependent on the, the inspector lottery um, because there are, there are fewer inspectors prepared to allow a section 38.6 case than those who are sort of pre-wired to allow an appeal under uh, the tilted balance uh, but it's always worth running and you're missing a trick if you don't running and plainly covid both the housing and economic implications that uh, are going to be highly relevant in that context um, so that's all from me. Uh, we've got a few minutes for Q&A and I wonder, Gail, whether uh, you've had the, um, uh, the longest head start to your question. Um, so the question for you, I, I think viewers can probably view the questions, but just in case you can't, I'll, I'll read out. What weight can be attached to Ridge and Furrow in the context of Lister building the village? What test needs to be applied in considering whether development of Ridge and Furrow is acceptable? Um, uh, and is, how is this work in policy and law and is it likely to change? So uh, any thoughts on those issues? Yeah, I've done a few cases relating to Ridge and Furrow earthworks and they are a, a particular type of asset that needs considering in a particular way. Um, with regards to the specific question about listed buildings and whether it might contribute to a listed building in a village, it will be entirely on a case by case basis. So it, it may do, it may not. It certainly doesn't necessarily contribute. You'd have to consider things like date. Is the asset the same date as the earthworks? Ridge and furrow can be medieval, post-medieval, can even date to the wars as well. So you'd have to be very careful to look at it, date it, of which there are various, various methods of doing that, and see if there was documented historic association, even if they were the same date might be issues of intervisibility. So definitely on a case by case basis, but by no means all, is all the ridge and furrow in the vicinity of a village contributing to a listed building within the village. In terms of the test of acceptability, most commonly, this is paragraph 197 of the MPPF relating to uh, non-designated heritage assets. There's only one scheduled monument that is Ridge and Furrow in its own right, and even that mentions Lynchett's too. The, there are areas of it where it's scheduled in conjunction with such things as deserted medieval village earthworks. But you know, if you're, if you're um, proposing that, then your, your chances of success are really minimal. Um, most of the time you're dealing with it as a non-designated heritage asset under paragraph 197. So you've got two things to take into account. 
level of significance and level of harm. In terms of level of significance, there's a, a study which was completed by Historic England and Northamptonshire County Council 2001 called Turning the Plough. And this identifies the most important areas of Ridge and Furrow in the East Midlands, which is where a lot of these earthworks occur. So if you're in one of those 40 townships, um, and it is the whole township, which is normally the same as the parish, which must be considered. You shouldn't deal with it field by field. That's really important. If it's one of those priority townships, it might be a non-designated heritage asset of higher importance. And you can also look at all the factors that are mentioned in turning the plough to see how far down the scale of importance you go. There are a lot of factors, survival, uh, amenity, value, documentation, all of these things. So get in perspective how important it is as a whole township or parish. And again, level of impact must be considered in terms of the asset and the asset, that study is very clear, is the whole of the township, so all of the earthworks. So even if you're impacting upon Ridge and Furrow, you're usually likely to be impacting only on a small part of the whole of the asset. One other thing to look out for, and that is local planning policy and neighbourhood planning policy. A lot of neighbourhood plans, especially in the East Midlands, contain specific wording with regards to Ridge and Furrow. And indeed, some of them identify areas of Ridge and Furrow and specifically um, consider them to be non-designated heritage assets. Really, that it, they should be in accordance with the MPPF. So again, that goes back to paragraph 197 of the MPPF. One last point on that is, is it likely to change in terms of um, changes to the MPPF? Of course, if it's contributing to the significance of a list of building by a setting that relates to the Act rather than policy and guidance, and the same with if it's one of those areas that's scheduled. However, with most of it being a non-designated heritage asset, it's quite hard to imagine that consideration of non-designated heritage assets is going to be swept away particularly because that's a class of asset that includes an awful lot of below ground archaeological sites. So if consideration for a ridge and furrow that uh, encompasses the majority of it is going to be swept away, really you'd be sweeping away the protection for a lot of archaeological sites below the level of scheduled significance. So I wouldn't anticipate that being the case, but I, I guess we'll just have to see where, where things are going. Thanks, Gail. Um... Andy, a question for you, um, from a fellow um, uh, landscape expert. Um, he says, um, Glivia makes guidelines for landscape and visual impact assessment, makes no mention of the MPPF's concerns about landscape. Um, should it? What's your view? Okay, so I'll keep my answer fairly short, mindful of time. But what I would say, Charlie, is that um, Glivia, as it was prepared in 2013, was clearly deliberately prepared in the context uh, of the, the methodology and it was completely independent of the, the planning policy and guidance of the time. And in some respects, you could argue that's a good thing because preparation and setting out the methodology has not been influenced by the, the winds of change and directions of policy and guidance at that time. However, uh, what that the consequence of that means is that when you're following the guidance to the latter um, and to the letter and you follow it through and you prepare your LBIA, um, you reach a point where you have a, a schedule which identifies in summary the effects upon landscape elements, landscape character, visual amenity, but it and it gets the the project so far but it often stalls short of the finishing line because what an LVIA does not do is go on to talk about how your findings in that report are going to be interpreted against relevant landscape planning policy um, in the plan, in the development plan or in, in the framework, guidance and policy. And so there is a, a, a real danger, and I see this all the time, that you can submit a perfectly adequate or um, appropriate LVIA for a scheme, but it doesn't go the last stretch, the last mile, and actually then take the findings and analyze that against the policies in the plan and if you look at the policies there's usually more and more now because obviously because of the green agenda and climate change and all of that um, and so what you see are detailed policies about green infrastructure provision um, you might see policies about the setting of the settlement relative to the surrounding area or a gateway locations 
but none of that can actually be picked up in the LVIA. And so unfortunately, that's where a lot of um, applications flounder because the LVIA doesn't go on further to talk about uh, how it relates to policy. And you could argue that's a, a planner's domain, but I think it's right for landscape professional to comment upon landscape planning policies. I believe they're most qualified to be able to comment on how um, a scheme either offends or accords with that relevant policy given their experience and uh, training. Thanks Andy. Uh, uh, one last question um, for Neil um, and other questions to Neil have been answered in the inviting in the in the Q&A box. Um, Neil, I'm going to ask you the first part of this question. Um, in, in response to you pointing out the standard method leads to about 260,000 homes per year, so actually a shortfall of 40,000. You're asked, could it be said that uplifts, um, employment rates and other uplifts, lead to the 300,000 so um, by overall subject to the uplift the standard method is doing its job um yeah i mean that is best laid plans that was the government's intent um that it provided a minimum and then council would go above and beyond to deliver 300,000 however in reality because the former mppf local plans remain operative for five years then we've got the transitional arrangements. Many plans are still subject to those, such that we're still working under the former MPPF in a, in a large number of plans. The minimum of the standard method won't actually come to bite until the late 2020s. And that's just for plan making. If we were to continue to operate using the standard method, where you haven't got a local plan, an up-to-date local plan, you're not taking account of the national need for 300,000 homes because you're going back to this 266. So the standard method just doesn't doesn't work either in the plan led system because of the delays or in taking appropriate account of the national housing need now. And I might quickly pick up on the la latter point, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. The 300,000, contrary to household formation evidence, that household formation evidence is evidence of what happens when you chronically undersupply housing as has happened in, in the country. So if we're to continue to rely upon that evidence, we're planning to chronically undersupply housing in the future. The only evidence we've got that's workable is that there's a need for 300,000 per annum nationally. We're using that and trying to get the best distribution of that we possibly can using a new standard method in accordance with the government's proposals. Thanks, Neil. Um, much appreciated. Well, that's that's all we've got time for. Um, thanks um, to all the panellists um, and thanks to um, everybody um, involved in this uh, webinar for attending and, and for the various questions you've asked. It's been our real pleasure. I hope you found it useful. And as I said, we'll, we'll have circulated um, a list with um, the key decisions and cases so you can reference those uh, to the extent that you need. Thank you very much indeed. Have a nice uh, rest of the day.